Dr. Hamilton and I are here at the ACE meeting in, in, in Los Angeles 2019, and we're just going to go over some of the highlights as we see them. We obviously couldn't be everywhere, uh, but uh, Dr. Hamilton uh, chaired an excellent uh, symposium on the pre-day, Wednesday, before the meeting that lasted all morning on uh, lipids, cardiovascular disease, so why don't you tell us about it? Well, I, I, I think that we wanted to express what happened in a patient that are at risk or have cardiovascular disease or congestive heart failure or their relationship. So we went kind of from pathophysiology with the cardiologist, um, uh, Matt Budov, uh, excellent, excellent cardiologist and a vascular person, and he reviewed both the role of lipids and glucose in the pathophysiology and the development of atherosclerosis leading to heart disease in people with diabetes. Uh, we went, then went ahead and looked and discussed what is the role of managing lipids, what should be goals in managing lipids, who should be, and that's what you, uh, Paul Gellinger, have done, uh, and uh, being uh, the chair of the 2017 Lipid Guidelines by ACE, and also very well acquainted with all the lipid uh, products since then, and the new ACC guidelines. So I thought you got a very nice work in highlighting uh, what's important and who are the highest risk patients or extreme risk patients in where we are and what should be their goal of management. Following that, um, uh, Zach Blumgarden, a uh, terrific guy from New York who is also the editor-in-chief of uh, Journal of Diabetes, he actually did a whole um, coverage of the cardiovascular outcome trial. This is in a very interesting, holistic way. He looked at different trials, he made some meta-analysis, so it wasn't going just uh, the routine trial by trial, but he put them in groups and tried to show where they would be relevant in different uh, uh, patient types. We continue then with the presentation of other comorbidities of people with diabetes, obesity, insulin resistance, and, uh, uh, and lipid disorders, and we looked at the role of the kidney, and we looked at the role of kidney in the development of cardiovascular disease. This was done by um, Christopher Mendy, a nephrologist from uh, University of San Diego, clinical professor. And by the way, everybody so far has been a clinical professor, right? <laughs> You're a clinical professor in Miami, uh, and, uh, and Zach Bloomberg then is a clinical professor in uh, Mount Sinai, in New York, and um, uh, Matt Budoff is a clinical professor in UCLA. So, you know, a really very high status group of people uh, that were there. So. Uh, Chris, when he presented the kidney data and its relationship to cardiovascular disease, ended this discussion with some brand new data that we got from a trial called Credence that was just presented last week in Melbourne, Australia, and that was a, a study that we knew that is going to be superior in its result. We just did not know how good it will be. And Chris actually showed very nicely how the majority of people with kidney problem in diabetes, like the one that have an estimated GFR of 45 to 59, benefited by near 50% in reduction of the outcome, which was doubling of, um, uh, of uh, creatinine, doubling of uh, estimated GFR, or kidney death, and uh, also reduction of albuminuria. An incredible, incredible uh, result. Now, the totality of the result uh, showed also result in people from 30 to 45. They also had a 25% reduction. On top of that, there was also reduction in cardiovascular disease. And in credence, that was over 4,000 patients, 50% of them had established cardiovascular disease, but 50% were primary prevention. And we saw in the primary prevention result that we typically see only with people with established disease. And has, this has to do probably with a severe uh, kidney disease that they had. Yeah. So, and, and um, they had a, a 40, roughly 40% 40 uh, reduction in admissions to the hospital for heart failure, just yeah. like the other SGLT2. So there's a real 
heart failure component, but I was part of that symposium. And the, the, one of the themes that came through, not only on my presentation, but on, certainly on Matt Budos, is the importance of coronary artery calcium scoring as an important risk stratifier. And it's emerging as time goes on, it gets more and more powerful. Uh, how useful that you almost don't need to stratify risk by any other tool. You can use a calcium score and, and really uh, come in very, uh, very precisely uh, assessing risk. Uh, the understanding, and he showed this data as well, that a zero score is highly protective. Uh, a little bit unclear yeah. what to do with the one to a hundred. Uh, uh, that's a gray zone, but probably uh, needs to be uh, treated in most cases over a hundred. Yeah. Yes. The, the reality is that once you have calcium score, you already know that the, the process of atherosclerosis is going on. And you should stop it. Maybe you don't need to be incredibly intense between 1 to 99, yeah. but you want to halt the of progression. Course. I think it's already going on. Look, when, when, cal when plaque calcifies, it, it's already ruptured into the lumen. and the cal It's a healing yeah. process, so yeah. it's significant, a significant uh, uh, process already. Uh, he also in, uh, show, uh, previewed uh, some data in type 1 diabetes and calcium scoring. And it turns out it's quite predictable there too, and there's very little uh, information. And it's on very and, and, and it's very important because now we actually know, even though we have known it for 15 years, but it became more too light, that people with type one disease have an elevated risk for cardiovascular disease, despite the fact that seemingly the lipids don't look bad. Okay. They usually have a higher HDL, not so high triglyceride, the LDL is at lower level, and they still have an elevated cardiovascular disease. This is just the regular type one. Right. What we know today also that we have the obese type one. We're starting to understand type one a little bit more and which patients are at higher risk. Some are not. Uh, but many are, and of course the calcium score really, really brings it home. My presentation was comparing the ACE guidelines with the ACCHA guidelines, and I try to show that in many cases patients who, who are at the extreme risk category for ACE, which we have a very aggressive LDL goal of less than 55, would not qualify for uh, LD, severe extreme LDL lowering or severe LDL lowering using PCSK9 with the ACC guidelines. They sort of fall between the cracks. Uh, doesn't mean they're not going to be treated if they're, if they're uh, at 70, but they're not in the use PCSK9 column uh, unless uh, they meet certain criteria, and many patients don't. And it's uh, just a sort of interesting, uh, interesting uh, sidelight to show the potential to fall uh, between the cracks and not get aggressive LDL lowering. It was a great symposium. Uh, so I then actually highlighted another part of that that was is the congestive heart failure epidemic that we're seeing right now in people oh, yeah. with diabetes. And this is becoming real big. And this has to do also with the fact that we have um, the recognition of congestive heart failure with preserved function, not the typical one that we used to know, which is reduced function, always pre preserved. And issues that may be related to the epidemic in obesity, uh, the problem with that is we don't have a lot of tools to manage that. And I just pointed out that I am not looking for endocrinologists or primary care physician to uh, start managing people with CHF, but to be able to identify them early, try to prevent it progression and refer them when it's appropriate. Other part of that symposium, also pretty good, we had Elliot Brin who is a lipidologist from Utah, he looked at the totality of managing people with dyslipidemia, went to manage, he uh, looked at people with high triglyceride, he also looked at some people with high LDL. He then highlighted some of uh, a very important study, the Reduce It, uh, that came not too long ago that uh, showed some spectacular results uh, on patients that were very well treated with statins to below 100 LDL, which five years ago the ACCHA said you don't manage them anymore and they were on very maximal therapy of every uh, anything else glucose control uh, blood pressure control however uh, what um, uh, it showed this significant reduction in uh, five point 
mace right. and uh, right. a twenty five percent reduction, including CV death. Add a twenty percent reduction. Actually, when, CV you, death. when you add all events, subsequent events, it's thirty percent. Yeah, when the uh, yeah the total event. But let's suppose it's uh, even though it was pre specified, it's still look at a speculative post op uh, result. But this is incredible. So we had also Dan Einhorn, clinical professor of medicine from uh, UC San Diego, and then gave a very nice uh, overview of how we take now the knowledge that we got from the outcome trial and apply them to managing patients with uh, hyperglycemia and patients uh, with diabetes, highlighting a couple of facts. He highlighted that metformin, there's no reason not to continue using metformin as first-line therapy, even though a lot of people say, well, it doesn't have the uh, CV outcome data, and he had some very compelling point to his position, and also the fact that the, at the ACE 2019 uh, algorithm recommendation for practice, we say that based on this outcome data that we have seen, uh, people that have diabetes and established cardiovascular disease, actually if they are not on a SGLT2 or GLP-1 receptor agonist with proven efficacy, these people uh, should be on one of them regardless right. uh, of glycemia. And well, the fun part of it was finishing the, the, that uh, uh, conference with a case that we took it not in the traditional way on measure how do we manage blood pressure and glucose and lipids which is all very important and hypertension all very important but also going ahead and looking and saying hey the patient is already on four or five medication for blood pressure for lipids for glucose and so on and the A1C is CL 7.8, and the LDL is 87, and the estimated GFR is 56, and the patient had an established cardiovascular disease. Which drug are you going to choose? What, what, he framed it as you have one thing to do. You can't do more than one thing. Correct. And that the panel uh, really... Everybody uh, collapsed. Yeah, Why? Because not, people yeah. don't know what to choose. And they don't do one thing often. They often well, they, no, <laughs> but, but remember, they are already on five drugs. So it's not that it's you do two things on a new patient. Well, something. Uh, so anyhow, but that was very interesting. It showed, it underscores the great times we live in with all this outcome oh, trial yeah. and the complexity that it brings to clinical medicine to know when to choose. But remember, we saw another case um, a couple of days later in this meeting. Uh, this was uh, actually a, a symposium uh, presented on uh, also on kidney and CHF and heart disease, but we saw a patient, a young patient, you know, he's, he's, uh, Juan, sounds like he's a Latino, uh, who has diabetes for six years and he's now 33, and he had calcium score of 375. I think this is, gives you an answer. You say, in this kind of a guy, you first have to deal with the atherosclerosis and you first have to take his LDL well, well all the way down. Here, it's easy to choose the PCSK9 yeah. as your choice. <laughs> so you know, there are, you get clues when to choose a drug. Well, it's, it's the one-on-one, -on -one, the art of medicine, and no, no two patients are, are alike. So, but not that the ACE meeting is entirely about lipids and diabetes Correct. and outcomes. There were many other things here that I didn't get a chance to witness uh, them all or participate. But one, one theme throughout, both at the plenary session and at some of the uh, uh, symposia, was the emergence of all these anabolic uh, bone osteoporosis agents. It's got unique properties because it's both anabolic and anti-resorptive. It's an anti-sclerostin, uh, uh, a monoclonal antibody. And up to now, we have good anti-resorptives and we have good anabolics, but we have no agent that's both. And the data that was shown throughout this meeting at several uh, 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 symposia and at a plenary session is extraordinarily impressive about how much bone can be built with the new combined uh, anabolic uh, anti-resorptive agent, uh, uh, which was just approved. Uh, so that's exciting. It's a real advance of osteoporosis. Uh, and, but Beyond that even, the ability now to start recommending better, that you start with an anabolic agent, and this one is probably is going to be the 
better one compared to the older that yeah. we had. Yeah. But you know, we still have anabolic like for TO that people have been using. Loss, yeah. But they learn over the years that the best way to go is to first give the anabolic and then you continue with the anti-resorptive yeah, yeah. as and opposed to the other way around. Right. And not to go the other, the way, way, around way around and, other, yeah. and clearly not to give anabolic and anti-resorptive at the same time except for this uh, new agent. So I thought that came out in this meeting yeah. very nice. Yeah, so that's, there were, that's there were also a lot of device in diabetes meetings and you know, uh, session looking at pumps, session like looking at continuous glucose monitoring, how to manage them in patients today, how to use some new terms like time and range and changes in variability that you're using with CGM, a very powerful tool. A lot of them were seen, were shown in this meeting. And then there was an interesting presentation this morning, very different than anything I've gone to. Apparently, the guru of, of the internet in medicine, uh, a doctor, Kevin Fu. Fu yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, he did he did this remarkable 50-minute presentation. He's quite a, a um, motivational speaker, but he's developed. He's the number one physician uh, in terms of blogs and and, and, and all this uh, internet uh, or uh, what's the word social media interaction. And he went through his story as to how that's made a huge difference not only to him but to a lot of patients and doctors all over the all over the country. So to have a plenary session devoted to uh, social media and how doctors can harness social media and how doctors can um, and, and doctors and patients can uh, get the benefit of social media I thought was was interesting uh, I don't know how many physicians in the audience were convinced to begin to go down that pathway but uh, it was certainly interesting to, to listen I, to you know there's a sizable, a sizable amount of physicians that are going particularly on Twitter nowadays and then they yeah. say the word and then they look at what's going on but it's usually more discussion amongst themselves it's not like getting uh, exposed before patients or right. the public it's more like sharing medical information yeah, he showed uh, several yeah. examples where patients clearly benefited from his yeah. social media uh, efforts and and physicians benefited too uh, He's quite, he's quite an interesting, uh, entertaining speaker, and, and he's, he's done quite, quite a lot. So other session that, that we had here, well, Ace has now six, six disease networks like thyroid, diabetes, uh, bone and parathyroid, yeah, the various uh, uh, glands, adrenal gland, uh, uh, sexual glands and so on. It's another disease network and there is uh, lipid and uh, heart health also. And so we had an ear in review that each chair yes. um, uh, was highlighting, you know, what was new in uh, the past, uh, you know, year in uh, in their area, there is also an obesity obesity one. So Tim Garvey, again a professor of medicine from Alabama, uh, showed what's new in obesity. Showed some of the newer ACE guidelines. Uh, highlighted a couple of the newer newer trials in obesity, and actually highlighted the fact that with using obesity medications and using lifestyle modification to reduce weight has a very good impact on diabetes and when we're looking at people with pre-diabetes probably the obesity drugs should rain on that area. And then there was the follow-up plenary session from the uh, Dr. Roy Taylor. Taylor from England who showed remarkable reversal of diabetes on very low calorie diets. Yes. Uh, practically near 600, 700 calories and everything goes away. It's like you, it's quite remarkable. We sort of all always knew that, but his methods uh, make it easier and apparently patients are able to, to, to stay on it. So everything Everything really uh, that followed very the year review sessions were new, I think, to Ace and were yeah, very, that's were very good. Time, yeah. uh, actually, a very good idea. Yeah. And there were other sessions: that it, orbitopathy, Graves' disease, patients whose eyes bulge right out. Pro proptosis has always been a very difficult thing to manage because it, when it's severe, you need to you need to go to surgery and reduce all the tissue that's behind the eye. They now have some new medications that again, it's an block. antibodies. Right, it's, yeah. a, it's a monoclonal antibody that uh, uh, yeah. that stops the growth. It actually inhibits IGF growth factor and other growth factors around the eye, so it's quite striking. So advances are fast and furious, and ACE 
seem to cover them. Yeah, and there were several thyroid sessions and looking at, you know, when to biopsy nodules, how to continue with nodules. So, so those thyroid sessions were very uh, helpful. Uh, we had a very fun debate on uh, oh, yes. the I guidelines. That, yeah. The ADA is the consensus guidelines for managing diabetes versus the ACE, and that was, again, me kind of represented the ACE side, and uh, Dave D'Alessio, who is chief yeah, of endocrine in uh, Duke University, who looked at that from, he's one of actually the authors of the ADA. It was ASD. called The Great Debate, and the just which guidelines are better, and it was well done. It yeah, well so, done. so we really found, I think, weaknesses in each one, and strength of each yeah. one, and to see how much closer we each and got to each other, just presenting it in, in a yeah. different way.